How many of you know it's great to be all together? And I mean, uh, I, I don't know how many, um, how many of you are, are, I guess you're all pretty well aware that, that we like to partner together in different things. Our, we are one, we have a real heart to support um, a lot of the missions that Destiny Church does. And so we're so pleased when we hear reports of what's going on in the Philippines, what's going on in um, greater parts of Southeast Asia, and all of the ways in which we can work together towards building the kingdom. Amen? Um, I'm looking forward to vacation. I'm not even joking. Uh, we've been moving. We've been building. We've been doing all kinds of things. Uh, we had the privilege of baptizing seven people yesterday in our backyard. Come on, seven people, including our youngest son, Josiah. Um, and, and it was just spectacular to see God move in his life. And, but I wanted to share a report because I know that sometimes you may not always hear what's going on, you know, with, with uh, even me and Chelsea. I wanted to share a little bit. At the beginning of COVID, so back up like, back up like two, two and a half years or so, right? Um, everything moved to, to, to going kind of digital or kind of online or, you know, just a way that we could get the word out. And the Lord spoke to me and he said, Ben, if you cannot go to the nations, then you have to sow. And I said, okay, well, well how am I going to do that, God? You know, it, 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 what are the trustworthy, you know, kinds of funds that I can give to? What can I do? And he said, you can preach the gospel. And so I, I said, okay. And I didn't, really know, I didn't really know how it was going to work. I remember saying yes to my first invite in India. It was 3 in the morning. I was dressed in a collared shirt. Back then I had hair. I don't know what happened. I asked God for boldness. He gave me bald. I said, God, boldness, not baldness. Anyways, but, but uh, so I was dressed up. I was ready to preach. And I, I, I just let it rip in a cinder block house. Um, and maybe there were 10 people there. It was like 3 in the morning, and I was like, God, this is what you asked me to do. <laughs> Come on, I don't know about you, but I was like 3 in the morning. I'm all ready to like preach, and I think there's this, this lady and like five people in her house, and I was like, my gosh, God, what is this? And he's like, no, I wasn't at home. No, I was, I was on the South Shore. Yeah, I was from a studio at 3 in the morning, Online, not in India. They're here. Everyone understands that? Okay. So if I couldn't, if I couldn't go, I had to sow, sow my time, sow, sow the word, sow into people's lives. We're clear. Okay, good. Thanks, babe. Yeah, and so I was like, God, okay, let's do it again. And I remember, you know, showing up, and, uh, and this guy was like two hours late, and I'm like, okay. I'm ready to go, and then it was like, oh, yeah, and then all of a sudden, here's this, and, and it was very complicated, okay? Let's put it that way. It was not easy, and it was translated, and I was like, God, I don't know if I really like doing this. How many of you know God doesn't care about how you feel? <laughs> do, you re do you realize God does not, like, particularly care how you feel? Yeah, we talk of blessings. We talk of, you know... Um, you know, the power of God. We talk about the enabling work of the Spirit, but we don't always talk about how God doesn't care about how comfortable you are. When he asks you to do something, he just cares that you're obedient. Amen? So eventually we found um, that while this ministry reached out to us and we were, we were working with Sammy and, and doing all kinds of different things, seeing harvest in Canada. Amen? But I was like, God, what about this promise of the nations? Because you said if I couldn't go, I'd have to sow. Well, if I sow, then I know that there's going to be a harvest. Come on, somebody. Like, like you don't sow unless you intend to reap a harvest. And a harvest can come in many ways. It can be, it be in blessings. It can, it can come in relationships. It can come in finances. Come on, somebody. But I was like, God, I want to see the fullness of what you promised. And we're, I'm going to position myself again. You know, to just continuously say yes. So this ministry from Pakistan reached out. And I was like, God, there's hundreds of ministers in Pakistan that message me every month. What is different? And he said, say yes to this man. Okay. And so we've been doing village outreaches consistently over the last two years. And I just did one uh, a week and a half ago. Would you like to hear what happened? Yeah. 
So they, they, they go, I wish I had, the, I wish I could project this like cool people, but I can't. Um, and they put a, a sheet of paper over, a sheet of paper. They put a sheet, like a bed sheet over a brick wall. And they all line up and we have about 20 minutes to preach the gospel over Zoom and then get out. You know, Pakistan is a mostly Muslim nation, yeah? So it's not like we're exactly free to gather in the streets, preach the gospel. But they hang a sheet somewhere, they zoom me in, I have about 20 minutes. And in 20 minutes, God can do what? God can do everything. I, I want to read you just this report alone, can we? All right, here we go. It says, greetings to you, dear pastor. What a blessed time it was. We had over 99 souls get saved and many of them healed. <laughs> One woman who had an issue with her eyes got healed and gave testimony. One person who had an issue with a kidney was healed and gave testimony. One lady suffering from an evil spirit got delivered, gave testimony. One kid was unable to walk and started walking while you were preaching and gave testimony. Is anybody else in the room here? Come on. Come on. Over 78 testimonies took place and other testimonies, different kinds of pain being healed over Zoom in Pakistan. I can say to you now that of the small village outreaches I've been part of, over 1,000 people have given their life to Jesus. Over 1,000 people have given their life to Jesus. Come on. Just by saying yes, who knows what God can do with you? Who knows what God can do with you? Earlier this week, I, I taught 1,000 pastors in Pakistan. Thousand pastors all dressed up, really, really dressed up, taking pictures with their telescopic lenses. I said, I don't know how good that photo is going to be. You're taking a photo of a screen. But God moves so powerfully in their hearts and their lives. I just wanted to share that. It's not really associated with anything I want to share today, but I wanted to encourage you that we can do more together. As we partner together in prayers, as we partner together in support, we're better together. Amen? Amen. So I just wanted to encourage you to give you some good news because God is faithful uh, to complete that which he started. So hopefully, I don't have a thing about straight. I want to talk to you guys straight. today about the rhythms of grace. How's that sound? Rhythms of grace. I don't know. Who's ever heard that before? The rhythms of grace. Come on. Um, grace. What is grace? A lot of people have defined grace as God's riches at Christ's expense. Right? And we've heard all kinds of different definitions of grace. I want to bring a, a definition of grace that, 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 that really God's been working in me for some years now. And grace being the supernatural power for us to live like Christ. It's the enabling power of his Holy Spirit. Enables us to, to live beyond our ability. And, and, and it's, of course it's unmerited. I mean, everything is unmerited in the kingdom. Amen? Right? Bible says that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So everything is unmerited, right? So we can't just see grace as a permission for us to continue to live how we want to live. We can't see grace as a big giant band-aid that we put over a gushing wound. Like, pff, we can't do that. Grace is not permission for us to stay and, and make excuses like, well, I'm in a process. How many people have heard that? I'm in a process. And some people are actually in process, but let me tell you this. If there's no progress to your process, there's a problem. Are you hearing me? I, I'm, I'm tired, and I'm not saying that it's here, but in case it is, well, here you go. Um, you know, if you're in process for year after year after year, I'm here to tell you gently in the Lord, I love you. If there's no progress to that process, we have a problem. And it's time to break out of the victim mentality. And it's time to arise and become the people that God has called you to be. And you are called to be a solution. You are called as a solution. You are not a victim. <laughs> Come on, you're not some kind of pet project. You're not a problem. You're an answer that's ready to be delivered to this realm. Amen? Amen. Come on, somebody. We're going to have some fun this afternoon. Is that okay? Come on. See, the world has a rhythm. It runs according to patterns and cycles and what we call natural laws, right? There's a law of gravity. I drop the bottle, it's going to fall. It's the law of gravity, right? And what Christ did, he shed his blood 
so that the veil could be torn, so that there could be this powerful, um, this powerful access granted to you so that you could see beyond the natural world and start to see into the spirit. And so one, one concept that we have to grapple with is that the flesh, when we talk about the flesh, what am I talking about? I'll give you something simple. Maybe I've done this last time I was here. This is the flesh, okay? Taste, touch, feel, smell, see? The flesh, the natural man, right? The flesh is the veil. The flesh is the veil. So I'll put a pin in that because it's a, it's a concept that we have to understand. Jesus Flesh was torn so that we could see beyond the flesh. I'll say it again. Jesus' flesh was torn so that we could see beyond the flesh. So the flesh is the veil that keeps us from understanding the spirit man. Come on, we're going to go a little deep. Is that okay? Are we ready to eat a little bit? Come on, he tore the veil so that you could see. Come on, I'm excited already. Come on, somebody. Come on, let's, uh, uh, how many people, you got either a paper Bible or you got some digital form of Bible here? Because we're going to need, we're going to need to go in, okay? We're going to go into Romans chapter 8 together. Come on, somebody. I'm excited. If you get this, I really felt I, um, excitement in my spirit when God was like, I want you to share on this. And I was like, okay, well, you got to like download it because, you know, <laughs> make people understand. Um, when you get this, your life will change because you will no longer remain in a place of paralysis. M much of the church has been paralyzed because they got polarized. They saw things one way. We've been presented things one way. Someone has been begging for your agreement. Everything in this world has been calling out for you to give it power because you have power. So everything in this realm is trying to get you to come into agreement with it so that it can have power because without you, there is no power. Oh, come on, somebody. Come on. If we get polarized, we get paralyzed from becoming the solution. We get backed into a corner. We get grouped in with one lump of people. And, and our voice gets watered down by the narrative that all of this other group has. But we're people of the kingdom. I'm not here to be political. I'm here to set you free from polarization. I, because the word of God is here to set you free, to pull you out. If you've been in a pit of polarity, if you've been put in a place where you felt like someone uh, made you vocalize your opinion and now you feel marginalized or you feel like your voice is watered down, the spirit of God is here to set you free from that pit of polarity today. Come on, and you can be free. Come on, and the Bible says who the Son sets free is free indeed. You need to be free because from that pit, you will never be able to enter into the promise. If you are in a pit of polarity, <laughs> you're, in, you're in a place where you've created a, a, an echo chamber. So there are many people that think like you, talk like you, and reinforce your beliefs so that it feels safe, but it's not safe. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous because it actually limits you from hearing the voice of God. Because what if the voice of God is saying something different than what this voice is saying? Is it not the Lord? I want to challenge you today. Are we able to go beyond the flesh? Because flesh equals comfort. Flesh is taste, touch, see, feel, smell. Like it's, it's what we engage this realm. Like I know what wood feels like because I felt it before and it's been programmed into my system. And so I think that I, uh, I know the fullness of this, but I know very little because I only know it according to the... Come on. We're getting somewhere. Woo, come on. Romans 8. I promise this is going to be good. 
<laughs> Romans 8 verse 7 says this. Come on, we're talking about, we were singing about the blood of Jesus, how the blood of Jesus has tore the veil. We have kind of like a veil here, right? So imagine blood of Jesus all of a sudden made a way for us to see beyond, right? Come on. Romans 8 verse 7 says this. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Where is 8? Okay, it's too many notes. 8 verse 7. Because the carnal mind, that's this guy, the flesh, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So there's what I just said. If you're in the pit of polarity, if you're in a place where you're doing what you want to do, if you're in a place where it's all about what I can see, what I can touch, what I can feel, what I can control, what I can govern and rule myself, that's a place that's hostile towards God. Amen? Come on. It's not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who are in the cannot please God. That's pretty simple. Why? Because we're living to please ourselves or others. That's right, Marilyn. Either way, we're looking to please man, mankind, or people with flesh on them. Right? Come on. Verse 9, but you, turn to your neighbor, say, yes, you. Turn to your other neighbor, yes, you. But you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. Verse 10, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of sin righteousness. Just a side note, I want you to, uh, if, if all of you, if you study the word of God, I beg you to study that word righteousness. I beg you to see the fullness of this word because this is so key for us um, navigating the end times, if you want to call it that, it, it, the days that we're in, right? The, the Bible's so clear, you know, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for Righteousness. So we better understand what righteousness is, right? Righteousness for so long, we've been sharing a dimension of the definition of righteousness. Uh, and, and it's not wrong to say that righteousness is right standing. Yeah. However, when we look at the word righteousness, it has to do with justice and fairness. Justice and fairness. And if you carry justice in your heart, Solomon asked for this gift. Many times we say, well, Solomon asked for wisdom. No, he asked for the ability to walk in wisdom. What he really asked for is for justice and fairness to rule in his heart, right? The Bible says that righteousness and justice are the foundation of God's throne. So if we're bringing simply one part of a definition that righteousness is right standing with God, then who is the one that is responsible to continue to make sure that they're living righteously every day? We can say that we believe that righteousness was given to us, and we do, because we can quote a verse, he became sin that knew no sin, that we may become the righteousness of God. But I'm asking you in your every day, who is the one that's responsible to walk in righteousness? We are, right? But if our definition is simply making sure that I'm in, oh, I'm away from the screen. If my, if my definition is simply that I'm making good decisions or I'm, or... <laughs> I'm making good decisions or I'm presenting myself in a certain way, then what I'm doing is I'm actually watering down the work of the Spirit in my life 
And I'm starting to, to pump myself up and saying, man, I, I made a good decision right there. You know, I think God would be very pleased. You know, I spoke very well. I did not swear today. There was no cuss language that came out of my mouth. I, I did not. You know what? I, I, I'm doing a way better. I ate a lot less this meal than I did the last meal. God would be really pleased with me and my decision. You know, I drank less this year than I did last year. God would be quite pleased with me because I'm, I think that I'm righteous. There's only one problem. The Bible says there is none righteous. <laughs> no, not one, right? Right? And, and so, and Jesus came to address this partial understanding that even the teachers of the law had. And, and, and so they were like, well, I have like, I don't have mixed threads on my clothing <laughs> or something ridiculous like this. And, and it was all about, you know, how their works made them look. And I want to submit to you that we've kind of looked at righteousness as something that we do to keep score of how good we are. Am I wrong? So when we look at that word righteousness, we need to understand the fullness of it is justice and fairness. Jesus came for the marginalized. Jesus came for those that didn't have a voice. Jesus came to write injustice. Jesus came and spoke and, and advocated for the minority. Jesus came and, and he made sure that, that there, there was fairness everywhere he went, yeah? So when we talk about righteousness, that's the kind of heart that we need. That's the kind of heart that will set the world free. That's the kind of heart that cannot afford to live in polarity because polarity isn't fair. I'm just submitting it to you. Are we okay? Come on. <laughs> wow, where are we? I'm still here. I'm still reading. Yes. Romans 7 verse 10. Let's go back. I, I needed to, to, to expand on righteousness. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the, but the spirit is life because of righteousness and justice. You can literally say righteousness, justice, fairness, and you would get part of the totality of what that word means. And we quote this. We love this one, verse 11. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's a little bit mysterious, a little bit of a mouthful, but let me explain it to you this way. Yesterday we had a baptism. In baptism, you're going down into the water, symbolizing being dead to yourself. And then you're being raised in newness of life in Christ, right? So that's simply what that means, is that uh, the, the old the old man that has these passions and desires, these selfish ambition, these kinds of ways of being led by the flesh, that one is subdued by the Spirit of God. And now that's your job every day, is to allow the Spirit to rise in you, who takes power over that other guy. We're all on the same page. Don't want to confuse you, okay? Thank you, Jesus. See, Christ has broken the power of cycles. And his spirit now enables you to transcend the limitations of this realm. Did you know that? Uh, let, me show you, uh, let me show you this in Galatians 5 when we read about the fruit of the spirit. Can we go there? Galatians 5. Thank you, Jesus. I'll, I'll just read it if, if you want to mark it down. You all have notepads on your phone anyways. I know you do. Galatians 5, verse 16. Let me, let me start here. It says, I say, then walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's what I just talked about. If you're walking with the Spirit, then the flesh has to whoop, submit, right? Verse 17, for the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the the flesh. What an interesting word to use. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Come on. Come on. You can't be contained. 
You can't be controlled because the spirit is not bound. And this is not like specifically referring to the law of Moses. This is referring to this guy here. These laws. Come on, we ought to get excited about that because how many of you know that that God wants to do, and we quote this verse, but there's a catch. God wants to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we could ask or imagine, but it is according to his power that works in us. So how willing are we to allow his power to work through us? Because he can do it, but are we giving him permission? God work in me, like search my heart, like search my motivation, like I surrender to you. And when we allow that x-ray to take place, we allow the Spirit of God to search us and know us, right? Then it's his power working in us. And, and at times it's, you know, I love you, but I don't like that right now. Or I, I'm, I'm, that behavior needs to change. We need to work on this. That response was, was not a response of love. It was a knee-jerk reaction. You were offended here. Or, or this is broken here. This pattern of, of communication is not working. And his spirit will, will work within us. That, and that's his great power. And it's really his mercy, you guys, to do that deep work within our lives so that people can really see Christ fully. Amen? Come on, he's so good. Let's keep going. Verse 18, Galatians 5, 18. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, adultery, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, (laughs) Okay, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Whew. Of which I tell you beforehand, as I've told you in past, that those who practice these things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I want to submit another thought to you. How many of you have ever heard, read that verse and said, well, if these things are done, then no heaven for me? Anybody ever believe that? Oh, come on. There's a list of things, and if I've done these things, I question whether or not I can enter into heaven. Am I the only honest one? I read that, that list, right? That word kingdom, it, it, it means authority. It means power. It means influence. It means rule, right? And if you want to be able to walk in authority, if you want to be able to rule, if you want to be able to reign, if you want to be entrusted to build the kingdom of God, none of those things can be part of your life. Very simply. So if you've been reading that and making sure that you're checking the list, okay, every day make sure I'm not going to do this and this and this and this and this and this and that, because if not, I'm not going to get this. Be free. Honestly. That was for free. Okay, anyways. Uh, Moving on, verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit, yay! Okay, we love this fruit of the Spirit. Guys, if we don't ask tough questions, we'll never get breakthrough answers. Very, very simple. If you don't ask a tough question, you'll never get an answer that could help you break through in your life. So many people live under shame, guilt, condemnation for things that they have done, and they work constantly disqualifying themselves of the promises that God has made for them. And they lack knowledge. That's why the Bible says people perish. Dreams don't get realized. People don't enter into their promised land. Destiny doesn't get fulfilled because of a lack of knowledge. We can't be that way. We cannot afford to just follow the masses and just, you know, continue. We can't do that. We need to ask questions. We need to be intelligent as the church of God. Amen? I'm not talking about getting into arguments and fruitless disputes. Like, don't do that. That's just it's a waste of time, in my opinion. It's a waste of time. You know, we can encourage one another without looking at each other under a microscope and fault finding. I'm talking about asking questions of the Spirit. Asking the Holy Spirit, what is this? Using the tools that are available for you to be able to interpret this, that which you've been given. It's been given to you. So that you can rule and reign. But it's also 
been given to you, the challenge has been issued to you for you to understand what it says. Amen? This is a very, very good teaching church, so you're in the right place. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Okay? There is no law. Amen? So, I love this. Come on, Jesus. So your obedience to the Spirit of God breaks you free from any law, pattern, algorithm, whatever you want to call it. Your obedience to the Spirit is actually what breaks you out of those patterns and cycles and now brings you into a new rhythm of the Spirit. Come on. Your obedience to the Spirit breaks you out of the natural laws, limitations here in this realm and allows you to have access to a new rhythm. It's a rhythm of grace. It's a rhythm of the Spirit. Amen? Come on, somebody. Let's look at this. Let me show you this. Um, because this is the reality is perpetual obedience creates perpetual momentum. Perpetual obedience will create perpetual momentum. And when you find yourself surrendering to the Spirit of God and surrendering to the rhythm of His grace, there's a certain pace that starts to happen. And all of a sudden, what used to take you, you know, two hours in prayer, now you're having time with the Lord and very quickly the Spirit of God is like, no, not this. And you're being aligned. You ever go to a chiropractor and all of a sudden, you're getting cracked? You're getting aligned. There's, there's a momentum that comes as you surrender to the Spirit of God over and over and over. There's a perpetual momentum that starts to take place, and then there's a pace that the Spirit wants to keep you at. You need to be running the race at a certain pace. And there's a grace, and I don't know why I'm rhyming, but it's, this is good. There's a, there's a pace that you're called to live at, guys. You're, you're, you're not a problem. You're a solution. But if you're constantly in this place of struggle, if you're constantly in a place of offense, if you're polarized, you'll be paralyzed. You'll be out of the game. God wants to keep you at a certain pace, and it's his grace that, that enables you to stay at that pace. The onus really isn't on you to perform. It's on you to surrender. Amen? Uh, look at this. Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? I, I can quote it. It says, I beseech ye, therefore, brethren, in view of the mercies of God, to present yourselves as a living sacrifice. So I willingly lay myself down every day what I would like to do, how I would like to feel, uh, you know, um, maybe what I would like to say or what I would like to not say, you know. Anything, I lay myself down. And in verse 2, and do not conform to the patterns to the customs, uh, uh, to the algorithms, if you will, to the rhythms of this world, to the natural laws of this realm. Uh, don't be a victim to those things, but, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And this is, your, this is, this is all worship, you guys, is, is allowing the Spirit now to lead in, 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 my, in my mind uh, and allowing the Spirit to take charge, not my logic to take charge. And this is how we break out. Because God wants to break us into something better. Amen? Are you with me? You're with me. Because it's time for you to arise. And I want to declare this over you. I, I, I know you've probably had this read over you before, but I want to declare Isaiah 60 over you. Just verses 1 to 3, quickly. It says, arise. Arise, right? Come on. Like, arise from sleep. Like, get up. <laughs> become, become the light. This is what it's saying. Arise, shine, for your light has come. And the glory, the splendor of the Lord is risen upon you. The weight of his presence is upon you. His life is in you. He wants to shine out of you. So it's time for you to arise and become who you were created to be. Why? 
For behold, verse 2, for behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. How many of you recognize what's going on right now? The earth is a dark place. But we can choose to either uh, be, be bitter or be better. We can choose to either live in, in, in victimization or live in victory. It is our choice. It's our perspective. God is giving us an invitation to see with new eyes. He wants us to see from heaven's perspective. Because heaven's perspective changes everything, you guys. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. There's depression, there's, there's suicide, there's, there's all kinds of sickness, there's all kinds of fear, all kinds of torment. But, how many of you love it when God butts in? Come on. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. And the Gentiles shall come to the light and kings to the brightness of who's rising. I want you to read it. Your rising. You're rising. Why? Because you have allowed Christ to rise in you. Bible says, if the same spirit, come on, that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, then your mortal body will be quickened. That involves your mind. <laughs> come on, it involves your health. You will become a sign and a wonder. People will look at you and wonder, how does Marilyn have the capacity to do what she does? Right? You know, how, <laughs> you know, how is she able to do all of these things all at once? There's got to be a secret that she has that I need to know about. Because when God starts to arise within you, it is visible. There's a change that's seen. And you know what? I've seen it. People come out like this. In one day, there's a, there's a shift in their mind. There's a decision. I'm no longer going to stay in this place. And there's a shift. And in one day, there's the deliverance of God that comes upon them. And they start to rise up as a solution. I've seen it, you guys, too much, too much uh, to, to not believe that he doesn't want it for each and every one of you. It's the time. It's the time right now. We're in a time where you are necessary. It's time to rise out of the place you've been contained in. I'm about to land the plane here. I want to take you to Colossians chapter 1. Come on. Because the truth is you're needed. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're needed. Your other neighbor, you too, you're needed. <laughs> Come on. You have an answer. You have an ancient mystery encoded, embedded, hidden in you. And this is what Scripture talks about. Colossians 1, 26, 27 says this. The mystery that has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints to them, God will to make known what are the riches of the glory of his mystery among the Gentiles. So those that don't know God, right? Christ in you, the hope of glory. Everywhere you go, you are the one that possesses the answer to any problem that there is. When Jesus commissioned his disciples he said go into all the world uh, 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 go into every ethnos every sphere of influence and rise up as a solution and make disciples uh, 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 the reason why people would want to be discipled by you is because they see christ within you they see solutions within you. You could be working your job and all of a sudden uh, everyone's freaking out because there's this crazy deadline and all of a sudden you're in peace. And because you're in peace, a solution comes. And now there's an opportunity for you to have a voice. And as you rise up and you start to share, you start to become the solution to that problem. Come on. That is Christ in you. That is no less spiritual. You know, you might be working in the education system. And, and, and you might, like Chels. Chels has been working in the education system. But God has risen her up as a voice in that school. 
has given her a carved out position of favor to, to take care of, of, of these social activities for the kids so that life could come to them. Christ is rising up through her. And because living that out is more powerful than you having right words to try and convince somebody that they need Jesus. How many of you know it's more powerful if someone lives like Jesus and then people are, are drawn to them because there's something in them that I need, something about you. When I get around you, something in me becomes alive. You need to realize how, how powerful you are. When you get around people, the best in them starts to come out. And there might be the worst that comes out first. But if you're patient, and if you're like Jesus, if you lay down your life, you will see the best come out of them. Why? Because you are the hope of their glory. Because you carry Christ. Are you ready for the next one? The greatest potential of every man, woman, and child is to be a unique expression of Christ. But do we recognize that? This is a tough question. We love 2 Corinthians chapter 5. I want to read this, this verse. 2 Corinthians 5, 16, right before a, a famous one that we love to quote. It says, therefore we regard no one according to the flesh. Now, we used to regard Christ according to the flesh, and thus we do no longer. If we regard no one according to the flesh, what happens to our judgments? What happens to our preconceived ideas? Oh, come on, somebody. What, cop what happens to our traditional values we've been raised with? Oh, I'm, I'm touching a little bit close now. And what happens to our comfort? Let me tell you guys. God wants to give you eyes to see the potential in every person. So I'm not saying that you have to be okay with the way that people live. Like you're not endorsing their, their, their decisions, but you're also, you're also not encroaching on their decisions. I'm not telling you to ignore things going on in their life completely if they were to come and, and you know, ask you. You know, just an example. Well, I don't know why, you know, this job doesn't understand me. You know, all I want to do is have fun. You know, I stay out late a few nights. You know, I probably had like, you know, 20 drinks or so. You know, what's wrong with that? You know, this, this boss just doesn't understand. Um, this job sucks. <laughs> I'm not saying pat them on the back. They're there. Yeah, don't know what his problem is. <laughs> you know, they open themselves up. Well, but it's the way we even talk to people. Can I submit something to you? Perhaps the amount of drinks is a bit much. Can I, can I offer some wisdom to you? See the humility. We're so quick, you guys, with, well, you're stupid. <laughs> that was a stupid thing to do. Why would you do something like that? You want to keep the job or not, you moron? Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> we talk like this, and we think that it's love. Not love. It's not love. Love given in the wrong spirit is actually not love. That's pretty good. I'm just saying. Love given in the wrong spirit is actually not love. So there's a way, even as Christians, God wants to season us with salt. He wants to give us wisdom. He wants to give us, you know, we're having fun. Like, I, I hope you understand I'm speaking freely. But we need to see in each and every person their potential is to become like a unique expression of Christ in the earth. And if we see them as a solution, maybe we'll even learn something. This is like, I worked at a hotel. I worked at a hotel with so many different cultures. I learned so much about <laughs> myself and, and other cultures. And one of my friends, he was a uh, Jamaican man, and I ate lunch, breakfast, dinner, whatever, with him, whenever I could. And I found him hilarious. But he was quite brash and been through a lot of things in his life. And the Lord told me, I want you to eat every meal with him. 
And I was like, okay. I'm like, no problem. I think I could do this. But then the, sometimes the most crazy stuff would come out of his mouth. But other times I could see woundedness. I could see, wow, decisions. I could see regret. I could see, mm, like, feeling less than. I started to see the whole man. I started to experience as he was speaking, like, it's like I could feel. And, and, and there were moments where the Lord would say, oh, did you just see me? I was just there. Did you see me, Ben? I was like, where? He's like, and what he said, I was just there. Did you not recognize me? I was like, what are you talking about, God? <laughs> And then a moment later, some crazy thing would come out of his mouth. But, you know, another day would pass, another week would pass, and then he'd be speaking. And Here I am. Do you see me? And after a while, yeah, I got a, that glimpse. I saw you. I saw you were right there. Do we, can we be stretched to understand that the Holy Spirit is wanting to rise up in everyone? Because God so loved the world, yeah? Uh, and this is not, I'm not talking about, I'm not saying that everyone in the world, <laughs> I'm not making this big statement, I'm not a universalist or anything like this. Don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is that Christ wants to rise up in each and every man, woman, and child on the earth. And we need to recognize these moments, these little glimmers where he's actually speaking. And what if, what if we would have the humility to recognize those moments and actually learn from Christ in somebody else. If Christ in us is the hope of their glory, Christ in them is the hope of... Just something for you guys to think about. I don't know if you've ever thought about that before. It might stretch you, and that's good that, that you're stretched. Because we need, we, need to, um, we need to be a solution. And for so long, I think we've been trying to walk this line when God is saying it's actually, it's actually not as difficult <laughs> as you've made it. I've actually made it much more simple. So hopefully that's good. Uh, we're called to be a, a solution. When we recognize Christ in other people, we break out of the limitations that we break them out of limitations that the world has put on them. I'll give you an example. Somebody that has... Uh, I don't know, they have a um, learning disability, right? Um, and the whole time they've been raised on medication and all these different kinds of things, if we get to be around them and we start to be a solution to them, bringing tools, different things that God has given you, um, another thing that I've seen through my wife and her ability to do, she's able to break them out of even those labels and those patterns that have been put on them. So maybe that's you. And God wants to use you. I, I don't have very much more to share, so I'm just going to pray. But I hope that you got something from what I said. There's a, there's a rhythm of grace that God wants to bring you into. There's a pace that he wants to bring you at. And there are others that need you. So it's time to come out of your limits and into the unlimited power of the Spirit. Summary. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Father, I thank you, Lord, for my friends here. God, I thank you for each and every person in the room and online. God, we thank you for the power of your Holy Spirit that's, lead, that's able to lead us in life into the unlimited because you laid down your life, Jesus. You shed your blood so that we would have access to this place of unlimited potential. So we thank you right now that you're shifting people in their hearts, you're shifting people in their minds. I thank you, Lord, for conviction, Lord, in, in the room. I thank you, God, for, uh, for just a, a changing of, of mindset. I thank you, Lord, for even a, a withdrawing of judgment judgments that have been made against other people and against, um, you know, in different relationships and circumstances. I thank you for a rewiring by the Spirit right now in Jesus' name so that we could come out of a place of being ineffective and start being the effective solution that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on. Amen.